The Battle of Hohenlinden was fought on 3 December 1800, during the French Revolutionary Wars. A French army under Jean-Victor Marie Moreau won a decisive victory over the Austrians and Bavarians led by Archduke John of Austria. After being forced into a disastrous retreat, the Allies were compelled to request an armistice that effectively ended the War of the Second Coalition. Hohenlinden is 33 km east of Munich in modern Germany. General of Division MG Moreau's 56,000-strong army engaged some 64,000 Austrians and Bavarians. The Austrians, believing they were pursuing a beaten enemy, moved through heavily wooded terrain in four disconnected columns. Instead, Moreau ambushed the Austrians as they emerged from the Ebersberg forest while launching MG Antoine Richepance's division in a surprise envelopment of the Austrian left flank. Displaying superb individual initiative, Moreau's generals managed to encircle and smash the largest Austrian column. This crushing victory, coupled with First Consul Napoleon Bonaparte's victory at the Battle of Marengo on 14 June 1800, ended the War of the Second Coalition. In February 1801, the Austrians signed the Treaty of Luneville, accepting French control up to the Rhine and the French puppet republics in Italy and the Netherlands. The subsequent Treaty of Amiens between France and Britain began the longest break in the wars of the Napoleonic period. Background From April to July 1800, Moreau's army drove the Austrian army of Feldzugmeister Paul Cray from the Rhine River to the Inn River with victories at Stockach, Meskirch, and Hochstadt. On 15 July, the combatants agreed to an armistice. Realizing that Cray was no longer up to the task, Emperor Francis II removed him from command. The Austrian Chancellor Johann Amadeus von Thugut first offered Archduke Ferdinand Karl Joseph of Austria Este and Archduke Joseph, Palatine of Hungary command of the army but both declined. Because his brother, the capable Feldmarschall Archduke Charles, Duke of Teschen, also refused the command, the Emperor appointed another brother, the 18-year-old Archduke John. Clearly, the inexperienced youth could not cope with this enormous responsibility, so the emperor nominated Franz von Lauer as John's second in command and promoted him to Feldzugmeister. John was directed to follow Lauer's instructions. To further complicate the clumsy command structure, the aggressive Oberst Colonel Franz von Werother was named John's chief of staff. The armistice was renewed in September but lapsed on the 12th of November. By this time, Werother had convinced John and Lauer to adopt an offensive posture. Werother's plan called for crushing the French left wing near Landshut and lunging south to cut Moreau's communications west of Munich. After a few days of marching, it became obvious that the Austrian army was too slow to execute such an ambitious plan. So Lauer convinced the Archduke to convert the enterprise into a direct attack on Munich. Even so, the sudden advance caught Moreau's somewhat scattered French forces by surprise and achieved local superiority. In the Battle of Ampfing on 1 December, the Austrians drove back part of General of Division Paul Grenier's left wing. The defeated French managed to inflict 3,000 casualties on the Austrians while only suffering 1,700 losses. Yet, when the Austrian leaders found that Grenier evacuated Hog in Oberbayern the next day, they became ecstatic. Archduke John and Werother overrode Lauer's cautious counsel and launched an all-out pursuit of an enemy they believed to be fleeing. However, Moreau decided to stand and fight, deploying his army in open ground near Hohenlinden. To approach his position, the Austro-Bavarians had to advance directly west through heavily wooded terrain. Topic. Plans Moreau's main defensive position consisted of four divisions facing east. From north to south, these were commanded by General of Division Claude Legrand 7,900, General of Brigade Louis Bastoul 6,300, General of Division Michel Ney 9,600 and General of Division Emmanuel Grouchy 8,600. The divisions of Legrand, Bastoul and Ney belonged to Grenier's corps. Moreau held 1,700 heavy cavalry under General of Division Jean Joseph Ainge de Houtpool in reserve. Off to the south near Ebersburg were two more divisions, under Generals of Division Antoine Richepont and Charles de Caen. The divisions of de Houtpool, Richepont, de Caen, and Grouchy formed Moreau's reserve corps. 
Moreau planned to have Richepont's march northeast to strike the Austrian left, or southern flank. His main line would maneuver in open terrain and counterattack the Austrians as they emerged from the woods. De Can would support Richepont's. According to the battle plan drawn up by Wehrother, the Austrians advanced west in four corps. From north to south they were Feldmarschall Lieutenant Michael von Kienmeyer's right column 16,000, Feldmarschall Lieutenant Louis Willibrord Antoine Bailet de Latour's right center column 10,800, Feldzugmeister Johann Kollerat's left center column 20,000, and Feldmarschall Lieutenant Johann Sigismund Riesch's left column 13,300. The three southern columns marched near the main road from Hog to Hohenlinden. Meanwhile, Kienmeier followed the Isen River valley from Dorfen west to Langdorf, then south to Isen, before approaching the Hohenlinden plain from the east. Archduke John rode with Colorat's force, which used the main east-west highway. Latour used trails just to the north of the highway, while Riesch followed tracks just to the south. Due to the densely forested terrain, bad roads, and poor staff work, the Austrian columns were not mutually supporting. Their commanders mistakenly thought the French were in retreat and were rushing to catch their enemies before they could escape. <inaudible> <inaudible> Battle Colorat <inaudible> 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 and Grouchy's fight All Austrian columns started at dawn. Marching on the all-weather highway, Colorat's column made good time despite heavy snow. At 7 a.m., his advance guard under General Major Franz Lopper collided with Colonel Pierre-Louis Bonnet de Marconnet's 108th Line Infantry Demi-Brigade of Grouchy's division. Defending deep in the forest, the 108th held their ground at first. But, General Major Lelio Spanoki sent a grenadier battalion in a flank attack and drove the French back. Colorat committed General Major Bernhard Erasmus von der Roy's Bavarian Brigade and a 2nd Grenadier Battalion to keep the attack rolling. As the Austrians burst from the tree line, Grouchy led a powerful infantry and cavalry counterattack. Colorat's troops reeled back as the 11th Chasseura Cheval Regiment broke a square of Grenadier and the 4th Hussar Regiment overran an artillery battery. Both Spanoki and the wounded Marcognet became prisoners. Having lost five cannon, Colorat decided to suspend his drive until Latour and Riche came up on his flanks. Anxious about his open left flank, he sent two grenadier battalions back in search of Riche's column. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Attack on Grenier's wing. To the north, Kienmeyer flushed French outposts from Isen. These executed a planned withdrawal westward to Grenier's main line of defense. Feldmarschall Lieutenant Prince Karl of Schwarzenberg, who led Kienmeier's left division, pushed southwest to crash into the divisions of Bastoul and Ney. An Austrian force captured the town of Forstern, but Moreau committed to Hauptpool's reserve cavalry to help drive them out. A back-and-forth struggle began over the hamlets of Tading, Wedding, Kreiling, and Kronacker, which run in a north-to-south line. The Austrian Murray Infantry Regiment NR. 55 distinguished itself in the fighting for Kronacker, which lies only 1.3 km north of Hohenlinden. On the far north flank, Feldmarschall Lieutenant Archduke Ferdinand's division began coming into action against Legrand near the town of Hartofen. Latour, moving along muddy forest trails amid snow and sleet squalls, fell badly behind schedule. At 10 a.m., his column was still well to the rear of Colorat's corps. By this time, the gunfire from Kienmeyer's and Colorat's combats could be clearly heard to the front. Even more disturbing were sounds of battle from the south. Latour made the extraordinary decision to divide the divisions of Feldmarschall Lieutenants Prince Friedrich of hessen homburg and Friedrich Hohenlohe Ingelfingen into small task forces. He sent one infantry battalion and six cavalry squadrons to the north to look for Kienmeyer. One battalion and four squadrons marched south to find Colorat. After advancing the bulk of his column to the village of Mitbach, Latour sent two battalions and two squadrons to assist Schwarzenberg's attack and three battalions and an artillery battery to help Colorat. This left him with only three battalions and six squadrons. <laughs> <laughs> Richipance's envelopment Like Latour, Riche's troops had to contend with terrible roads and snow squalls. They fell far behind Colorat, reaching Albaking only at 9.30 a.m. 
Consequently, Richipanse's division passed in front of Riche. Near the village of St. Christophe, the two Austrian grenadier battalions sent by Colorat stumbled upon Richipanse's marching column, cutting his division in half. With single-minded determination, the Frenchman left his rear brigade under General of Brigade Jean-Baptiste Drouet to fight it out and drove to the north with his leading brigade, with the 8th Line Demi Brigade and 1st Chasseur A. Cheval leading, Richapont seized the village of Mitenbeth and advanced to the main highway. There he confronted elements of Feldmarschall Lieutenant Prince Johann of Liechtenstein's cavalry division. Leaving his two advance units to bear the brunt of General Major Christian Wolfskiel's cuirassier charges, Richapont's wheeled the 48th Line Demi Brigade west onto the highway. Aware that this route took him directly into Colorat's rear area, he formed the Demi Brigade's three battalions side by side with skirmishers protecting the flanks. Hearing firing to the east, Werother gathered up three Bavarian battalions from Colorat's column and sent them to investigate. These units moved to the southeast and became embroiled in the fight with Drouet. Two more Bavarian battalions under General Major Karl Philipp von Reed now appeared and blocked Richipanse's path. After a brief fight, the 48th Line overwhelmed Reed's men and Werother fell wounded. Riche's patrols told him that two French divisions were in the area. Instead of pushing into the combat raging to his front, he cautiously decided to wait for his stragglers to arrive at Albaching. He then fell into the same error as Latour. Dividing his two powerful divisions under Feldmarschall Lieutenant Ignaz Gulai and Feldmarschall Lieutenant Maximilian, Count of Mervelt into five small columns, he sent each forward on a separate forest trail. Riche held back three battalions and most of his cavalry as a reserve. Crisis <inaudible> 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 At 11 a.m., de Can came up in support of Drouet's brigade near the southern edge of the battlefield. The situation was very fluid, with units blundering into each other in a heavy snowfall. The fresh infusion of French troops finally broke through the opposition. Drouet led his troops north to the highway, where the 8th Line still battled Liechtenstein's cavalry. Spearheaded by the Polish Danube Legion, de Can turned east to grapple with Riche. Dekan's men overcame Riche's small columns one by one and pushed them back to the heights of Albaching. The Austrian managed to hold onto his hilltop position and capture 500 French soldiers while suffering 900 casualties. Sensing victory, Moreau ordered Grenier's divisions and Grouchy to attack around noon. Undeterred by Latour's weak pressure on his front, Ney swung to his right and began pounding Colorat's troops. Pressing his attack, he overran their positions, capturing 1,000 soldiers and 10 cannon. Grouchy also returned to the offensive. Hemmed in on three sides by Ney, Grouchy and Richapont's, Colorat's column finally disintegrated in a disorderly rout. Archduke John escaped capture on a fast horse, but many of his men were not so lucky and thousands of demoralized Austrians and Bavarians surrendered. In addition, over 60 artillery pieces fell into French hands. Latour learned of the left center column's fate when its fugitives flooded the nearby woods. Abandoning his position, he retreated to ISEN, leaving Keenmeyer to fend for himself. When Keenmeyer got news of Colorat's destruction, he ordered his division commanders to fall back. After a brief fight against Legrand on the north flank, Archduke Ferdinand pulled back with General Major Karl von Vincent's Dragoon Brigade covering his withdrawal. Legrand reported fewer than 300 casualties while rounding up 500 prisoners and three guns. Thanks to Schwarzenberg's able combat leadership, his division escaped a very tight spot. At one point, a French officer came forward under a flag of truce to demand his surrender, but the Austrians successfully disengaged his command and brought them to safety that evening without the loss of a single cannon. <laughs> Aftermath The Austrians reported losses of 798 killed, 3,687 wounded, and 7,195 prisoners, with 50 cannons and 85 artillery caissons captured. Bavarian casualties numbered only 24 killed and 90 wounded, but their losses also included 1,754 prisoners, 26 artillery pieces, and 36 caissons. In round numbers, this amounts to 4,600 killed and wounded, plus 8,950 soldiers and 76 guns captured. The French admitted casualties of 1,839 soldiers, one cannon, and two caissons. 
Since several units failed to turn in reports, Moreau's army probably lost at least 3,000 men. Bastoul was mortally wounded. After the disaster, the Austrian High Command found its scapegoat in Lauer, who was summarily retired. Archduke John heaped blame on Riesch for being slow, but also considered Latour and Keenmeyer at fault. Werother escaped censure and in 1805 his plan at the Battle of Austerlitz contributed to that disaster. Bavarian Lieutenant General Christian Zybrücken blamed Austrian ignorance and ineptitude. Apart from Schwarzenberg, the Austrian commanders showed little initiative. Meanwhile, Moreau's division commanders performed well, particularly Richepont's. Archduke John ordered his demoralized army into a retreat. Moreau pursued slowly until 8 December. Then, in 15 days, his forces advanced 300 kilometers and captured 20,000 Austrians. General of Division Claude Lecorbe's right wing brushed aside Riesch at Rosenheim on 9 December. At Salzburg on 14 December, the Archduke held off Lecorbe in a successful rearguard action. However, in a series of actions at Neumarkt M. Wallersee, Frankenmarkt, Schwanenstadt, Wachelabrück, Lambach and Kressmünster during the following week, the Austrian army lost cohesion. Richepontz greatly distinguished himself in the pursuit. On 17 December, when Archduke Charles relieved his brother John, the Austrian army was practically a rabble. With French forces 80 kilometers from Vienna, Charles requested an armistice, which Moreau granted on 25 December. The decisive French victory at Hohenlinden set Moreau up as a potential rival to Napoleon Bonaparte. Topic: <inaudible> Legacy. The battle is the subject of a poem Hohenlinden by Thomas Campbell, 1777 to 1844. The first verse is: On Linden, when the sun was low, all bloodless lay the untrodden snow. And dark as winter was the flow of Iser, rolling rapidly. The American city of Linden, Alabama, originally known as Hohenlinden, is named in honor of this battle. It was established to serve as the county seat of Marengo County. The county's first European settlers were exiled French Bonapartists and many of the settlements they established were named in honor of Napoleonic victories. <laughs> 